Hello, my name is Greg Crinklaw, the developer of Sky Tools. I'm here with my virtual assistant, Cassie. Hello. In this video, we're going to create a basic imaging project. The three steps in imaging are selecting a suitable target, creating an imaging project, and scheduling. I like to think of it as the what, where, how, and when of imaging. This step is the how, right? Right. When we selected a target object, we chose what to image. Our imaging project will determine how we take the images and also where in the sky we position the camera field of view. So at this step, we are deciding everything except when to take the images? Yes, the scheduling step will decide when. Everyone, no matter their type of imaging, will use the target selection process and create an imaging project. But after that, things diverge, depending on how they take their images. We've created a workflow playlist for that next step. Choose the tutorial from there that best matches your control system. Now, I've selected the Sombrero Galaxy as my target. But look at this. Tonight, the moon is full and up all night long. The Sombrero crosses the meridian at noon. So this is a terrible night to image it. But here's the thing, we don't need to plan just a night or even a week ahead. I decided I wanted to image the sombrero, so why wait until February to create a project? I might forget about it by then. In fact, the scheduling process works best when you have lots of projects to choose from, so it can select the best ones to image on a given night. So go ahead and create as many imaging projects as you want. I'm going to create a new project by right-clicking on the sombrero and selecting Create Imaging Project. I could have also pressed Control n The imaging project is primarily defined by two things, the target object and the imaging system. Both of these were inherited from the target selection tool. You can start an imaging project in other ways, and these two things will be similarly inherited. So let's start at the top. This is the name for our project. It defaults to the name of the target, but it could be anything. The only constraint is that you can't have two projects with identical names for a given imaging system. I could also add details. So let's add LRGB so we can quickly see that this is for the LRGB filters to distinguish it from other projects for this galaxy. The observing program is a way to organize your projects. Let's say I image a lot of comets. I could create a comet observing program and assign all of my comet projects to it. So I'm going to click on the gear icon and I'm going to type in comets. So later when scheduling, I can have it schedule only the comet projects by specifying my comet observing program. And when looking through my archived observations, I could also narrow that down to just comets. The imaging system was inherited, but we can change it here if we want to. If you do change it, be sure to change it before making other selections, because the imaging system determines things like what filters are available. Here is our target object. We can open the object info. Most of the time, the focal configuration will be left at primary focus, but this system has swappable focal changers a 0.5 times focal reducer, and a 2 times focal extender. We can choose which of these to use for this project. And for a DSLR on a tripod, this is where we would select the lens to use. The purpose helps the scheduler make appropriate choices. In most cases, you will just leave it at general purpose. Set it to astrometry or photometry as appropriate. Select Moving Object Stack if you're imaging an asteroid or comet and want to limit the exposure times such that the object won't trail. The priority tells the scheduler how important or timely the project is. If set to immediate, it will be the first thing scheduled. Expose on single night, multiple nights, or ongoing. Select single night if your project must be completed in a single night. If the project can't be completed in one night, it will be skipped. Choose multiple nights if your project can extend over many nights before it is completed. 
Choose ongoing if you aren't concerned with completing the project. For example, you might be imaging a bright comet and plan to image it every night that you can. You can use this same project over and over for it. Lastly, we can set the tracking. This will normally be sidereal to track the sky. You can set it to solar or lunar as needed. Set it to target to track the target object, such as Jupiter, assuming your mount is capable of doing so. You can also use this to track a minor planet or comet. Normally these will move during the exposure making a trail. If you track the target, you can use longer exposures because the target will be held stationary while the stars trail. So those are your basic settings. So I suppose that the basic properties tab could also be considered the miscellaneous properties? Yeah. Some of these settings, such as tracking, don't really fit into the other tabs, so they're here. What are the project templates? The templates are a way to use the same settings over and over, so you can quickly create similar imaging projects. But let's move on to the other tabs and then come back to them. This is the Composition tab, and it's where we position the field of view of the camera, composing our shot, and maybe choosing a camera rotation angle. For large objects that don't fit into the field of view of the camera, we can also set up a mosaic, which will be covered in a separate tutorial. We can zoom in and out via these buttons. We can display a plotable image in the background. This can be any image with a plate solution, but most commonly it is a downloaded DSS image. Click here to download an image. Choose a source for the download and the survey. I'm going to get an image the same size as the object. The attachments folder is the folder where the image will be placed. We will put it in the default folder, which is the one shown here. If you put it into another folder, we would have to change the folder here to show it. Now, I already downloaded this image, so I'm just going to turn it on. This imaging system has a main camera, this rectangle here, and a guider camera. It has a rotator so we can rotate the view to fit the galaxy or to make sure that a guide star is in the guider field of view. I can quickly select the orientation via these buttons or type a position angle in here. Or I can grab the circle at the corner of the main field of view and rotate it freely. This angle includes a good guide star, marked in green, so I'm going to go with that. I can also grab the edge of the main field of view and drag it to any position I want. This isn't that useful for this object, but sometimes we want to include an object nearby. In some rare instances, we may want to record a subframe of the image centered at this same position. How do I change what this view looks like? I mean, can I select what things to display or change the colors? Yes. If I right click on the chart, I get several options. Here, we can control the magnitude limits in the same way as they are controlled on the interactive atlas. We can also access the view controls to select what things are drawn or labeled on the chart. Again, this works the same way as for the other charts. I could turn off the stars, for instance. Finally, we can open the chart preferences, which determine how the chart looks. Background colors, how the stars are drawn, fonts for labels, and so forth. This works the same way as the other charts, too. Down here is where we do the mosaicing, and this is a special function mostly for imaging comets. These things are covered in other tutorials. The Exposure Goals tab is where we choose what filters we want to use and how long we want to expose for. So let's start by selecting our filters. We'll do an LRGB set. Next, we will set the exposure goal for the whole project. This will apply to all of the filters. 
There are two ways to set our goal. We can manually force a total exposure time, or we can leverage the imaging model to specify a target signal to noise ratio. The settings for total exposure time are pretty straightforward. Set the total time that you want for your stack of images. It is set to 30 minutes in each filter. It's best to let the scheduler decide the sub-exposure times. So we normally leave this at auto, but we can force the sub-exposure time if we want to. I have set it to three minutes, so it will take 10 three-minute exposures for a total of 30 minutes. What about setting it by signal to noise ratio? How does that work? We select signal to noise ratio here instead, and then we specify the final signal to noise ratio that we want for each filter here. I'll set it to acceptable quality. Remind us what the signal to noise ratio is again. You can think of it as a measure of the quality of your final stacked image. A low SNR will look grainy. A high SNR image will look smooth and nice. The idea is to have enough total signal to overwhelm the noise in the image. People ask me what a good SNR is, but that's difficult to say. There are some general guidelines here, but you need to develop a feel for the SNR that will give you the quality that you are looking for. But more importantly, we can't talk about a signal to noise ratio without specifying what part of the image we're referring to. I mean, the bright center of this galaxy has lots of signals, so it's relatively easy to obtain a high SNR. The spiral arms have less signal, so we would need more exposure time to get to the same quality. And the faint halo takes even more exposure time. So it is very important to select the part of the image that your SNR refers to here. Do you only need the bright center to look good? Or are you going for the faint halo? Most objects have a sort of main extent, which is the main part of the nebula, or for a galaxy, it would include the spiral arms, but not the faint halo. Watch what happens when I select the very faint halo for this imaging system. It's all errors for every filter. When you see that, it's because even under ideal conditions and infinite exposure time, we can't reach the target SNR. So, what can we do then? We can adjust our expectations. We could accept a lower SNR or target a brighter part of the object. If we get the error for only some of the filters, there's also a way to adjust our settings for those individual filters. I'll show that in a minute. Some cameras have a variable gain setting, and you would set that here. Can that help us get a higher SNR? No. The gain boosts the signal and the noise together, so the SNR remains the same. Let's look at how we customize individual filters. The exposure time column tells us the total exposure time that will be required to reach the target SNR, which is 20 in our case. You can see that it's shortest in the luminance filter and pretty long in the green and blue. Let's select the blue filter and enable the customization for that filter. It's defaulted to what we set globally, an SNR of 20. If I change the SNR to 8, the time required to reach that SNR here goes down. Another thing I could do is change the binning. So this will trade resolution for signal. This is a common trick to set the color filters to two times binning for the color and then get the detail from the luminance filter at one times binning. So those are the exposure goals. But there's still one more very important thing that you don't want to forget about. It's these constraints here. This is for the scheduler to give it some input regarding the acceptable conditions for this project. The minimum imaging quality, or IQ, is critically important. By now, you're probably familiar with the IQ, which is a measure of the relative imaging quality at a given time. The night can be broken into quality blocks. The best part of the night is usually the A period, 
the next best is B, and so on. This tells the scheduler not to schedule this project during periods that don't meet this minimum quality requirement. Unless there is some reason to get your target right away, I recommend leaving this at the A quality. Lower qualities will result in lower quality images and longer total exposure times. I do not recommend using C, D, and certainly not F, unless you really, really have to. Check this box here if you're using narrowband filters to tell the scheduler that these should only be scheduled during moonlight, leaving the fully dark periods for other filters. Sometimes you may want to dither your images, which instructs sky tools to offset the telescope each time it is slewed, which can help remove artifacts in processing. There are a lot of other controls here. What do they do? Most of the rest are for special cases and are covered in other tutorials. These settings are used only for ACP scheduler. These settings apply only to astrometry and photometry. Lastly, I should say a few things about this area here. This is still somewhat of a work in progress. This is a summary of the signal data used by the model for this object. In the future, this will be replaced with a graph that shows the signal of the target object superimposed on the overall sensitivity of the imaging system for each of the filters. When it comes down to it, the table here tells you everything you really need to know. This area tells us something about the data being used in the model, so it helps us understand where the table comes from. There are three main types of objects, so you'll see three different kinds of things displayed here. The first are stars, which will list the magnitude of the star in each of the standard U, B, V, R, I filters. Extended objects, such as this one, display the surface brightness, again in U, B, V, R, I filters. For emission line objects, such as H2 regions or supernova remnants, this will be a list of emission line strengths relative to the H alpha line. It might say something like 500.7, 2. This indicates that the main O3 line at 500.7 nanometers has twice the strength as the H alpha line. Okay, so that's the basics of creating an imaging project. You said you would come back to the templates. Right, right. Now that we have seen all the main settings, the templates will make more sense. This is a quick way to apply the same settings to similar projects for this imaging system. It mostly saves the filter selection and exposure goals, but it also saves most of these basic settings. So let's save what we did for the sombrero now that we have it all set up. I click Save and then type a name in for the template, maybe Galaxy LRGB. The next time we want to do an LRGB project for a galaxy, we could start by selecting our template and then click Apply to apply those settings to the new project. What are these suggested settings? Uh, yeah, that space is currently intentionally left blank. Okay, that's the basics of creating your own imaging project. See the workflow tutorials and the project-specific tutorials for more on specific types of imaging projects. And there you have it. Clear skies, and thanks for watching. Clear skies.